Before I forget, there's an announcement that uh, I didn't make earlier. Or wasn't. I was not here. Was I? Anyway, we didn't know we needed to make it. When you leave the first four rows, right? First four rows. When you leave, if you take the Bibles and the hymn books that are under the chairs back with you and, and pile them, we always empty them out for BBS because otherwise the kids are all fidgeting and playing and throwing books at each other. And, you know, kids are kids, right? And we don't want that to happen. So if you can help us with that when we leave, don't do it now. Wait till I'm all done. Okay? <laughs> all right? Um, okay. Let's ask God to feel blessed. Father God, we come to you this morning, and Lord, we thank you and praise you again for the day you give us. We thank you, Father, that you brought us together in this community of that master's feet, discipleship ministry. Father, I pray that as we're here together to hear your word and to be able to take out of here something that we can apply to our life that will change us and help us to be uh, better people and better children for you, and most importantly, to be better witnesses for Jesus Christ. And Lord, I, I again thank you for the group that you brought together today. I pray that your hand would be upon us. I ask that the Holy Spirit will guide everything that's said and done here today. I ask that our minds would be open, that we'd be given understanding of the things that you want to teach us from your word today. And Lord, I once again just ask that you would help us. Just help us, Father. As we walk through this troubled world we live in, we pray for your protection. We ask that you would bind up Satan and keep him out of our lives and our families, that the distractions would not get hold of us, that we'd be able to focus on you, Father, and on your written word. Lord, we thank you again in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, we've uh, been looking at uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, last week we kind of wrapped up on uh, chapter 10. Uh, we closed last week, we looked briefly at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, where the Apostle Paul says, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And uh, most say that this really belongs to the closing of chapter 10. And, uh, uh, because through chapter 8 through 10, Paul dealt with the eating of food that had been offered to idols, right? And about how he witnessed to people, how he became whatever he needed to be was sharing the gospel message. As long as he didn't go against God's word, as he read the scriptures and learned from them, and also his personal convictions that made it right to, for him to live a righteous life. So, uh, the, one of the things we have to remember is the original manuscripts of, the, of God's word didn't have chapter and verse numbers. That was all added later on for reference so we could find it and be able to memorize it. I think I'll do that, right? Yeah, so. <laughs> Some of us, our memory is getting a little weak after, after a few years, yeah. So, but anyhow, uh, Paul said repeatedly, I will do whatever is necessary to lead others to Christ. I will do whatever is necessary, he said, to strengthen, encourage, and protect new believers, ones who are weak in the faith. And we need to imitate them in doing that to help them. Doing this without going, as I said earlier, against God's word or his own convictions, here's what he said in a nutshell. In love, I will sacrifice for you just as Jesus Christ did for me. In love, I will sacrifice for you, just as Christ did for me. That needs to be our attitude as we go through life. And see, there's a lot of things that, that go on in the world, and we all have our personal preferences and things that we believe, convictions in that, that uh, we need to do. And so as we live our life, those things get brought into the church, right? And now Paul's going to talk about some of those. He's kind of getting away from the, the food and the idol thing now. And he's going to talk about worship service. What should it be like in the worship service? And, and we all know that you can find a plethora of ways to worship God, right? As you go from church to church to church. Some are, are very quiet and, and very uh, uh, serene and, and uh, 
spiritual, you know, they, they come in and they sit in their chair and they read their Bible and they pray and they don't talk to nobody until the service goes on and when it's done they get up and they leave, right? We're kind of not that place, are we? <laughs> right? But we fellowship, we share the love of Christ together, and that's okay. That's our personality. It's, it's, a, it's a church family. And, and that, so, one of, that's what he's going to talk about now, is culture. How does the culture from out there come in here? And what's our culture in here that we need to take out there? Okay. So he's going to speak to those things. So, see, us as Christians, believers in Jesus Christ, that are here today, we owe much to others who have taught us, right? Who have modeled for us what we needed to know about the gospel and Christian living. Charles Stanley made the statement, none of us were born Christians. None of us were born knowing how to pray. And none of us were born knowing how to read the scriptures and study them. Without the Holy Spirit, we can't do it and know what God wants us to understand. So we owe much to these people. We should continue following the good examples of those who invested themselves in us by showing through self-sacrificial love the true meaning of Christian love and charity. That's what Paul did. We all know from when Paul was Saul, when, he all, when it all started, he, he was a jerk, right? I mean, he was against Christianity and all that. But once Jesus Christ touched his heart, he became Paul, and he became, he got the, the apostle of love, one of them. John was the other one that's most noted for it. So, as he imitates Christ, we should imitate him. And the people who we form our life after, we should imitate them. The ones who live by God's word. The ones who speak God's word and, and show it in their life. So, uh, that as we imitate Christ, they can imitate us. Amen? That's what it's about. It's a continuing thing. God didn't mean for us to get saved and then kind of keep it all bundled up inside and be a thing between him and me. He, he, it is, and it's important, but he meant for it to go out. He meant for it to go out. And I, I thank God daily for the people who influenced my life since I got saved and come back to the church and rededicated my life in that. Uh, a lot of really important people, and, and I'll remember them forever for the way they touched my life and the example they set for me. And there's also been, you know, let's be honest, okay, there's also been some people within the church that there's no reason for me to imitate them. I already was a jerk, right? And we don't want to be that person, and we seek to change that. So let's go ahead and take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll look at verse 1 through 16. We won't get through all this today, but we'll take a look. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. The imitators of me as I am of Christ. Now I commend you because you remember me and everything and maintain the traditions, even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman for man. Neither is man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? 
Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such patience, nor do the churches of God. Now, I just want to share with you very briefly as we start. Some sections of scripture are really pretty easy to preach, right? And, and to read and, and to teach and that kind of stuff. And some ain't, okay? And I don't have my flak jacket on today, so you ladies be kind and gentle as we work our way through this, okay? Because Paul is in no way putting women down, but he's talking about God's order of things. And this is, this is something that was specific in the church of Corinth. It was a cultural thing that he was addressing that was coming in the church. So I'm just going to start in here. We'll work our way through, and we'll get through part of it, and we'll finish it up next week, okay? So the scripture obviously moves on to another topic. He's going to begin to address the various issues on what is acceptable in church worship, some of which pertain to customs of the time and society, okay? During Paul's day, it was customary for a woman to wear a veil, similar to a scarf which covered her head and it hung down over her, her neck and her shoulders. No respectable woman would think of appearing in public without it at that time. Okay? So um, most of us would probably recognize the hijab that the, the uh, Muslim ladies wear, okay? Um, but it most, it most likely looked like that. However, it did not come from that. Because Paul wrote this scripture in the Holy Word today, 700 years before Islam came into being. So it has nothing to do with their religion. This is about their society and culture. Okay? Wearing a veil was widespread among women throughout the, the ancient Near East as a sign of honor, dignity, Security and respect. And there's a reason for that. In that time period, the attitude toward women was that, that they were inferior and second class. That was that time period. Okay? Jewish women could attend the synagogue, but they were kept separate from the men. And if it was a big enough synagogue, there was the women's court that they set up. So they didn't set up together. The Gentiles, the Greek women, were not allowed to attend school and get an education. So as women became believers and joined the church, they were looked upon with a degree of discrimination and narrow-mindedness as it came from the culture. In verse 2 of chapter 11, Paul starts out, he's going to praise them for what they have done right before he goes into what's wrong. He says, now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain your traditions, even as I delivered them to you. He praises the Christians in the church of Corinth because he heard either in their letter that they had written to him or the spokesman that they had sent to him. He, they, they were devoted to Paul, faithful to him. He was the one who, who brought Christ to them. He was the one who founded that church set it up and got it running before he left. And he, he taught them the traditions of the church, which were teachings and doctrines that he got as Jesus Christ revealed them to him or the other apostles shared with him. Because remember, he didn't spend time like the other 12 did with Christ when Jesus, when he was on the earth. He, he had the special <coughs> revelation on the Damascus Road. And then as God, uh, the Lord spoke to him, Throughout this time went on, he had other revelations. But he also spent time with the other apostles who were with Jesus, who shared the things that he spoke. Because you have to remember, they did not have this. How fortunate are we that we have this, that we can study it. And even make for us today study version. If you don't understand this, that God's word is, down here, scholars, Bible men have broke it down so we can study it and understand it. The thing we have to remember is we use a study Bible, though. This up top is God's Word. This down here is man's Word. You know? And there's sometimes a difference. So we have to be careful of that as well. So, in verse 3, 
He starts. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband. And the head of Christ is God. See, apparently there arose a problem in the Corinthian church about the women in worship. And Paul begins to deal with the issue as he gives them a theology lesson. And this is creation that he just shared with them in chapter 3. If you look at it, it's the way things happen. He says, I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Why is that? Well, it teaches us God's character, his plan and purpose and the order he does things in. And as we, we take, we're going to take a look at that in a minute. And we are to conform our attitudes and actions to use that in our life. It starts out with, Christ is the head of every man. And here, head means source of. Used in this context, head of means source of. All right? I've already read you this morning, some of you have read ahead, you know, I, I preach expository and we just follow the scriptures through, right? And I've already heard the jokes about the man is the head, but the wife is the neck, and she determines which way the head goes, right? You know? but, yeah, right? So, we, we, we know that kind of stuff. But this, this is God's presentation. Right? Christ is the head of every man, which means the source of. Christ was present at creation. Therefore, he was creator of every man. In Colossians chapter 1 and verses uh, 15 through 18, tell us this. Speaking of Christ, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or denominations or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. He was there for creation. He created when man was created, he was there. So he's the head of that, the source. The second thing that it says is that every, every believer's source of life is the a second. Christ is every believer's source of life in the new life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, and the new has come. It's because of his work that we become this new creation. <coughs> He's the source of it. Then he goes on to say the head of the wife is her husband. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 25. We always share this whenever we do a wedding. When Shara and I do a wedding, um, we always share the scripture with the couple that's going to have it. When you read it the first time through, you kind of get those uh, kind of looks. You know, it's like, but anyhow, this is God's word. Ephesians chapter 5, 22 through 25. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up to her. The husband is meant to be the head of the home. That's God's plan. Now it's sad to say in society that's not always true, is it? Some, a lot of homes don't even have a husband or a, a man there to fulfill that. But the man should be there leading his wife and children as their protector and provider, the spiritual leader of that home. That's God's plan that we be that way. But see, the other part of that, when God made woman, he took Adam's rib, didn't he? That was the source of life. So he's the head of that. And that's what that means. That don't mean he gets to be right all the time and have it. We do that anyway, right, guys? And, and, and so, but it means that he is the source. The third thing is, it says, the head of Christ is God. 
That doesn't mean that there's any difference. We know that in the, the triune God, all three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are equal. And that's the way it stays. Is what that means is Jesus submitted his will to God's will. And he did that in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. It shares about this. And it's entitled in the ESV, Christ's Example of Humility. Chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Have this mind amongst yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of God, of men. I'm sorry, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. <coughs> the Son humbly submitted to the will of the Father in coming to earth, becoming human, living in perfect obedience to him, which he did the whole time he was here, and dying for the sins of the world as part of God's plan. So the head of Christ is God, is it was God's plan. <coughs> Verses 4 through 5 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head since it is the same as if her head were shaven. So, here it talks about praying, <clears throat> the man who prays. This refers to public prayer, like during the worship service. When it speaks of prophesizing, here it refers to not just telling the future things of God, like the prophets in the Old Testament, but also to public speaking about religious truths, witnessing, for Christ and bringing God's words of encouragement to the congregation. It's basically when it speaks of prophesying here it's speaking of preaching in this context. And at this period of time men and women could do this in the early church and, and in their culture. Simply put, praying in worship is speaking to God for man. Prophesying in worship is speaking to man. For God. Whenever a man is standing in, in either of these two sacred holy positions of praying or, or prophesying, he is to have his head uncovered. You know, in many times in our culture, hats were everywhere. You know, when I was reading this study, I was thinking about my, my grandpa Joe, grandpa Baron. Whenever he was outside working, he had like a ball cap kind of hat on, always. And whenever he went away dressed up, he wore a black fedora. And he never went any place like this. But back then, because I'm going back a few years, we're talking in the, the 50s and early 60s before he passed away there. But that was just the way men dressed at that time, at least in that culture. But when it comes time to, to do God's work, the hat should come off. Why is that? Well, there's a reason. There's a reason. A man is created in God's image, who is in Christ by redemption, is to have, that's us, we're, we're re in Christ because of our redemption, is to have his head uncovered as a symbol of dignity and liberty. We are free. Right? We talked about our Christian liberties. We are free from our sin death. It's all because of what Christ did for us. So if we were, if we were to do this and I was wearing a hat, that would dishonor my hat who was Christ in speaking of. Not this hat, but that hat of Christ is what it's speaking of. So, to uncover their heads would have sent the message that they were no longer looking at their... I skipped something here, didn't I? Yeah. Sorry, I lost here. Okay. 
this stuff is, is kind of, you know, it's kind of not your everyday sermon, right? And, and, uh, but we, to honor God, we take our hat off when we preach and we pray. And that's the basic goal. Speaking to the woman's appropriate attire when praying or, or prophesying in worship or service, Paul says to keep their heads covered to maintain the appropriate cultural symbol. To uncover their heads would have sent a message that they were no longer looking at their husbands as head of the house. Gender roles would have been blurred. We have a problem with gender roles in our society, don't we? And we need to be careful as Christians that we don't mix that stuff up for others to see. So it would bring shame on the husband, which is their head, and it would confuse the congregation because women at that time wore this veil. Verse 6, For if the wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. If women will not cover their head at this point in time, then she might as well cut her hair off or shave her head. Because it's a disgrace either way. Why was really short hair or shaved heads a problem? Well, the application there, because of culture, women with a shaved head was a prostitute according to their culture. And the reason was, the prostitutes who served in the temple of Aphrodite had their heads shaved to mark them specifically as that. So culturally, when they see a woman with super short hair or, or a shaved head, they immediately labeled her a prostitute. So there was no respect there. So Paul said, simply, don't do that. Cover your head. If you're going to speak in the church in Corinth at that time, do what's culturally right. See, what we, we know, if you remember when we started this specific series, we learned that there was a very active feminist movement in Corinth, right? They were trying to take over the church, trying to take over the men's stuff, and were actually competing with them in business and that. And we, we know this phrase, all things are lawful. Well, some of these ladies took that to a, a, too far. They took it to a out of, out of uh, context in that. They had no thought of how their actions might affect the other Christians and the young church as a whole. Why was that? Because they created a distraction, a disturbance, and a disgrace within the church. And also within their community. And within the church, the unity was broken. We've talked about the unity that God wants us to, to worship on. You know, here, we are a coverage of our church, right? We planned it that way from the very beginning. Why did we do that? Well, I don't know about the rest of you, but when I talk to people about coming to this church, what one of the very first questions, they don't ask me usually what translation of the Bible, they don't ask, you know, how we share the gospel or that. They go, what's the attire? What's the attire? And I tell them, come to our. And I, I tell them, I preach in blue jeans and boots with a decent shirt on, right? And that's our culture here. And we want everyone to be comfortable and not to worry if their clothes are nice enough to come to church because it's not about our clothes. It's about our hearts and about our sacrificial service to one another. There was a, when we were in the motorcycle ministry, we talked to this lady that we were at Watson. You know, and a, a lot, of, most of you here have been in and out of Watson or whatever, and they're not a fancy dressing place. You know, there might, might be somebody show up with a sports coat and a tie and that along the way, right? But basically, it was dressed like we are now. And so this lady was worried about her attire to come to church. And we told her, just, just come as you are, you're fine. We dress. We were wearing leathers and black Harley t-shirts and blue jeans and boots and stuff on the church there. And nobody said a word, didn't care, right? 
This lady comes to church, backs into a parking lot, in the parking spot, a parking lot, and then somebody, guy backs up into her, gets out, and he's got a three-piece suit on. You know, she never came into church. And she never came back because we talked to her again. She thought that we kind of played a game on her or lied to her, and we didn't. But we don't worry about clothes. Plus, I like being comfortable myself. So, but however, we do need to dress so that we're not a distraction, that we're not a disruption in the service. A long time ago, shortly after we started, there was a lady that came here that wore her sports top and yoga pants to church on Sunday morning. And uh, she didn't dress that. We knew her. Char and I knew her and, and her and her husband. She didn't dress that way to go to work, but she came to God's house that way. Now, yes, it's a very important that she was here. But she didn't stay a real long time because she was uncomfortable being dressed that way. I guess our blue jeans and shirts were too dressy for her on that occasion. But see, it wasn't in our culture. It wasn't in our culture. And that's the problem that they had there. They created a disturbance in the worship service. And there's, there's more to it than that. We'll get more up into it next week. But we need to remember these things that we're studying right now are about a problem in the Corinthian church. It's not a problem in our church. It's a problem in the Corinthian church at that time. But we're studying it now so that we don't repeat the issue. Amen? That's why God had this stuff ready. Well, so that we can learn from the mistakes of other churches. And we don't want to do that. So we'll look at more of this next week. Let's pray. Father, we come to you tonight, today, this morning. And we want to thank you and praise you for your written word. Lord, I thank you that as the Apostle Paul wrote this to handle that situation in Corinth, that we're able to apply that to us today. I ask, Father, that you'll lead us and guide us through this continually. I pray, Father, that we can recognize where our culture is not only within the world we live in, Father, but also within this ministry. And we pray that whatever we do, we worship and praise of you, that you would find that honoring and a please. Lord, we do so much thank you and praise you. We love you and adore you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.